Something else. You want to stick it with your name on it? <laughs> no, throw it out. All right. I see that. Let me see. Let me see what they have there. So the first page is, of course, the Gemara itself. You can see the actual, the original. First two pages are the original, or maybe first page, both sides is the original. Then you have on the third page, then we'll start. Let me ask you a question, whoever's here. What are the stages of the Mishnah called? What are they called? That's the Tanaim. Then go the stage of the Gemara called Amaroim. What does the word Amaroim mean or Tanaim? Tanaim means teachers, Amaroim means sayers. They say, right. Who were before the Tanoim? And um, before, before you answer that question, who was the first generation of Tanoim? Yeah. Very famous. Right before the, the destruction of the Tanoim. First, second. Second, of course. The Bakiba was not the very first. It was a few generations into. Okay. Who was the very first generation of Tanoim? Hillel and Shammai. Okay. What were the name? What were the sages called before the era of Tanoim? And this this era started before Hanukkah even. Hanukkah was a few hundred years before the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. Hanukkah was about two hundred years, right smack in the middle of the tenure of the second Beis Hamikdash. Before Hanukkah, we had what we call the zugois, the pairs. Pirkeiovis, you'll see, it mentions in the beginning, uh, if you look, you have a, a sitter, you'll see pairs. Nitai Harabeli, and uh, I don't have any memory of the, you know, the names, but if you look into Pirkeiovis, you'll see names of pairs. He and he both said. Yeah, they can't, they, go, they, were, they were together. They were partners, uh, Havusas, what do you want to call them, or... They work together. They taught, they learned together, and they were called zugos, which means pairs. A zug is a pair. This went on for hundreds of years, um, up until the very end of the tenure of the, of the Besamikdash, second Besamikdash. Yeah, so they stood, not the very end, but close. Uh, no, that's when the era of Tanoim started. About uh, Rabbi Yechon and Zakai, he was like, he was the one that he lived before the Korban and he witnessed the Korban and lived after the Korban. So uh, the time of the Gemara was the night of the Mishnah was No, the other way around. The time of the Gemara is the Amaroyim. They're called sayers and the Tanoim are called teachers. Now, this is unknown, not unknown, but well, not well known. What were the name of the sages that followed the Gemara sages? Yeah. Following him, so we have Zugos, Tanoim, Amaroim, and then go. Huh? No, no way, I just skipped. Not me showing him. Rabbanon Sivuroi. Rabbis who clarify even more, gave more explanations to the Gemara. And they only uh, only lasted for 100 years. What are they called? Rabbanon Sivuroi. 
They went, they lasted, I think, from the year 500 to the year 600. And then started the era of the Gaonim. This is before Rashi, well before Rashi. The Gaonim, their era, their, they started from the year 590, I think, five something, until about a year 1000, close to the year 1000. Rabbeinu Gershom, Maragola, he was just about the first generation of Rishonim after the era of the Gaonim. The Gaonim were quite a few hundred years, four, over 400 years. Uh, Rab Hai Goin, Rab Nissen Goin, Rab Sadia Goin, one of the famous ones, Rab Troy Goin, and it goes on. Yeah. Where were these sages? Well, the sages of the Gemara were some in Babel, that's a Babylonian Talmud, and some were in Israel. Uh, later on, mostly were mostly in Babel. Most uh, sages were in Babel, were in Babylonia. So Rashi comes way after. Yeah, Rashi is already after. Now, when you get to the Rashi's generation, Rashi is the second or third generation of Rishonim. This is after the Gaonim, who were preceded by the Rabbanon Svaroi, preceded by the Amaroim and Tanoim and the Zugois. Who's before the Zugois, by the way? Well, then we had the Anshe Knesset Zagdolo, the Men of Great Assembly. That was before That was, they were there. Mordechai is one of them. Mordechai, Balshon, uh, you know, Sagis Chaya Malache, Tanya Michel Vazaria. These are the ones that were witnessed the, the building of the second base in Egypt. Purim, the Purim, you know, Purim miracles. Right there. So the Antic Nasag were the ones that instituted the, the text of our davening and the many other things, the benching, the davening. Who preceded the Antic Nasag Doyla? The king, the king. Then go the Shaftim. Then we go to all the way back to. Look what Judaism has. Look how it's still so alive and it, 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 it can't be broken. Okay, but I want to learn some Gemara inside actually. I, I was time, but I'm going to do that after Yontif when we uh, you know, get into the swing of learning. I'm going to go into more history and, and details of uh, each of the history, each of the eras. But what I want to share with you is something interesting. I, I did this last year, so if anyone heard already, just go like that. Um, look at the top of the page. You see the first page, the original. You'll see Rashi on one side, on the right side, and Tosus on the other side. And then you turn the next page, it'll be the other way around. Rashi will be on the left and Tosus on the right. So let me see this. So this is, this is Rashi. This is Tosus. This is the Gemara, of course. This is Tosus on the left. Tosus are not one person. There are many uh, of Rashi's grandchildren, uh, nephews, and all the whole gang, gang, holy gang of great people. Rabbeinu Tam was the greatest of all of them. Rabbeinu Tam, Yaakov Tam, his name was. They had a secret handshake. They probably had a side for sure. So Rabbeinu Tam, they, uh, so that's the Balea Tosos. Now, take a look at the Rashi. On the top of the page, you'll see that the top of, the, of, the, of every page, and if you go through every single page in the, in the Talmud, just about almost every page, very few exceptions, you always see, for some odd reason, four wide lines before the lines get narrow. Look on the top. Look on the right side, the Rashi side. You will see, on your page over here, you'll see that it, the lines are wide and then it gets narrow later on. So what's the reason, why is there, why are there four wide, wide lines? Because the four wide lines correspond so Hashem's four letters of his name. And why do we need to have that? Because when you learn Talmud, you really begin to understand, hey, I can master the Talmud. I can master Torah. It's just like secular studies. It's not divine. And Rashi helps you so much. When Rashi comes along, it makes so much sense. So therefore, there's a warning. For first, look at the top. You'll see wide lines to remind you that you have to realize that what you're learning, even if you can understand it, it's not because it's, Human logic, it's divine logic, but Hashem encapsulated his, his infinity, infinitude into our finite minds. So you have the first four lines. Now, even though it's a printing thing, but everything is Rosh Hashem The fact that it turned out this way is a symbol of a, a, a message to us that Gam Torah Pez above me Yud Kevavke. Yud Kevavke is not one of Hashem's regular names, it's his essence, beyond any meaning, past, present, and future. It has no meaning and there's no counterpart in Chol. Elakim could mean judge, 
you know, Kel can mean strength. Shem Dalad Yud means something else. Shemal means army. So these are other names that Hashem has that are not exclusively names for God. The only one name that only God carries is Yud Kei the Tetragrammaton. If you're not able to pronounce it in English. Yud Kei you can't pronounce it. People do in it. That's, yeah. So that's that. Um, it's interesting. Every page, every every beginning of every tractate in Palmas Bavli starts with page two. There's no page one. Why? Base. Huh? Because step one is not the learning. It's the believing that God gave us. If you believe God gave, now you can start learning. But if your step one is learning and there's no, no, no giver, it's just learning experience, you got problems. It's interesting that in Jerusalem Talmud, there is a Daf Aleph. And the Jerusalem Talmud, it starts with page one. Although the pages there are totally different. I mean, the, it, so I don't really know the reason for it, but it could be that when you're learning in Jerusalem, you see it's obvious, you don't need reminders. You see Hashem's presence so openly. The word Jerusalem is Yerah Shalem, complete fear, or, or Yashar. Hashem is straightforward there. Hashem's eyes are on the land of Israel. So you don't have this Babylonian, Babel, mixture, confusion. Talmud Babli is called the Talmud of Gullus, the Talmud of, of darkness. When you're groping in the dark, you have to, that's why, this, that's why Talmud Babli is so much longer. I'm now learning Talmud Yerushalmi from my parents' yard sites. I went through Babli and I'm going through Talmud Yerushalmi. It's so different. It is so different. It's jumpy. It just jumps quick. Chick chuck, Israeli style. Chick chuck. Question, answer, next. Question, no answer, forget about it, next. There is no, in Bible you have question, answer, question on the answer. What do you mean question on the answer? It goes back and you can mamish, get lost on the intricacies. But you show me, it's like a difference between seeing, opening the light and groping in the dark. When you grope in the dark, you go, no, that's not it. That's not it, that's not it. Uh, so you finally get to the end, so it's much longer. But if you have to open the light, I don't have any problems with having just walk straight and you know where to go. You don't have any questions, much less questions. Talmud Yerushalmi has much less questions. Rabbi Yochanan was the codifier of Talmud Yerushalmi. Who wrote, who put together Talmud Babli? The names? Talmud Babli, Ravina, and Rabashi. Ravina, Reish, Beis, Yud, Nun, Aleph, Ravina, and Rav Ashi. Ashi is spelled Aleph, Shin, Yud, yeah. Not, not, yes, yes, that one. Not Rabbi Yechon and Zakai. He lived way before. He was the, the first Tanoim, the first Tanoim. Yes, Rabbi Yechon, although he was an Amora, and whenever an Amora is an Israeli Amora, he's not called Rab, he's called Rebbe. So all the Israeli Amoraim, all the Mishnah are all Eretz Israel. They're all called Rebbe. If you want to be called Rebbe as opposed to Rab, the extra Yud, requires the land of Israel. The Yud has to do with Chachma, and Chachma is connected to eyes. So, the eyes of Hashem. So therefore, you want the Yud, you want the Rebbe, not just Rav, Rebbe means Rosh B'nai Yisrael, that level, it has to be connected with Eretz Yisrael. So Rabbi it's called Rabbi Yechanan, even though he was an Amarita. Okay, let's learn a little bit inside. So turn to page the, 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 after the, the first English page, the first page of the Art Scroll English. And I'm going to start with Amar Ababohu. You see it? Amar Ababohu, this little page over here. Have it? Bel Shofar. Lama Tokin Bishofar Shal Ayel. Why do we blow with our shofar of a ram? No, that's not the right page. It's, it's a short page. It's this, one? this page, a short page like this. There you go. You have it. Yeah. Good. Amor Rabbi Abo. He was an Amora. The story about him, <laughs> where his eye, his face was lit up. Like he was like a it was turned red. Whole face was red. So a matronisa, uh, you know, queen just, just died, so we'll talk about him. It was a queen, non-Jewish queen, who looked at him and said, my, you have been drinking. He says, no, no, my dear majesty, I have not been drinking. 
I've been drinking Torah and I found something new I never knew before. That's what you see in my eyes, in my face. He found a new Tesefta and he went, wow. That was like, you know, his, his breakfast in the morning. Why do we blow with a whole shofar of a ram? Even though we don't have to, but it's certainly better to use a shofar of a ram. And the answer, of course, is we all know. Omar Akadosh Baruch Hashem says, "Tiku lefanai b'shofar ayil." Blow before me using a shofar of a ram. What purpose? Kedei she'esker lechem akedas Yitzchak ben Avram. So that I will remember of your sake the binding of Isaac and the son of Abraham. Now, why do we have to say Isaac the son of Abraham? Don't, I think we all know Yitzchak Yitzchak was to tell you that it's not just the schos of Avram, but the schos of Yitzchak too. Avram Avinu, he actually had to do it. That's pretty hard to take your own son and chef. And Avram also heard from God the opposite. Hashem tells Avram Avinu, you'll have a lot of children for Yitzchak. He hasn't been married yet. So how can Hashem tell him to slaughter him? Avram could have easily backed out and said, God, you can't contradict yourself. You probably don't mean what you're really saying. Maybe you're trying to test me or something. But he didn't do that. And Yitzchak is the one who's actually being slaughtered. And yet... He was ready, and he could have certainly he could have certainly said, I would God didn't tell me to allow myself. He told you, he didn't tell me. So that's uh, you know, you can uh, it's not my your it's my problem, it's it's your problem, it's not my problem. I wasn't told by God that I have to be a sacrifice. And yet he didn't. If I, if my father heard us, I trust him. Al P he wasn't the way to trust him because God told him the opposite. So why should I believe your second? Why should I believe the second thing rather than the first? So Yitzchak also had it. Even from a Torah vantage point, from a God-believing vantage point, he could have easily said, I'm not doing it. And yet he didn't. That's the schus. Yitzchak ben Avram. It's both. It's Yitzchak and it's also the fact that he's a, a son of Avram. And when you do that, I will, anyone who mentions, who, who, who sounds, sounds the shoy for the ram's horn, when you do that, I will remember, look what it says here. I remember of your sake, the binding of Isaac and Avram, I will consider it for you as if you had bound yourselves before me. That Mr. Nefesh will count. In other words, it'll count as if you're doing the same thing that Avram Yitzchak did. That's what the power of a ram's horn is. Yes. Yeah. Because the bull's on, uh, uh, what's it called? Horn is called a karen, not called a shofar. It's not solid. It has to be hollow. The word shofar means a pipe. How do you say pipe in Hebrew? Shofaret. So it has to be hollow. And it's not. What? I don't know. I'm not Israeli. But I uh, wrote them. Shofaret. Like the pipe is like plumbing. Like the metal. Metal was the inside. Mayim over. over. No. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, that's why. You, you know what it is, for sure. A pipe. Um, Mayim? Picture. Then you have a sink and then you have a... Oh, Tinor, okay. Tinor, but also... <laughs> tinor. Right, Tinor is a more common word, of course. But Shoferet also is connected to the word pipe, too. In other words, I'm not sure what the... Um, if it's used in modern Hebrew, probably not. Um, okay. Shofar also has the meaning of shapir, which means sapphire. Like it brings tainu. Sapphire is brilliant, brilliant stone, sapphire stone. When we blow shofar, it arouses and elicits a pleasure that God has in becoming our king. You could do it nonchalantly or you could do it with tainu. And the word shofar, shapir, is connected to ta'anu. So it has a lot of meaning. Anyways, then comes the with a very strange statement, a very strange question. Amr Rabbi Yitzchak. And Rabbi Yitzchak says, Sister, and I'll talk. Lama tokin barosh Hashana. Oh, there's a word that's missing here on top. Why do we blow shofar on Rosh Hashana? It's missing. It's the word Rosh Hashana is missing on the, on the top of the next column. So what interjects? Well, what, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean, why do we blow? So it says so. You're not asking what's the significance. You're, asking, you're not saying for what reason do we blow. You're saying, why do we blow? Because the Torah said so. What kind of question is it? Yeah. Like Amara, like Amara asked, who is in Amara? Like who's saying? 
So Ravina Ravashi are quoting. They're the ones who compiled it, and they were aware of all the different conversations that went on. It's a bunch of people were saying, you mean, why do you say this? Ravina Ravashi heard that there was a conversation going on between Rabbi Yitzchak and, and another person. If you don't, if, it, if there's no name, just the Gemara talking, it means Ravina Ravashi themselves are talking. Okay, like Rebbe was the codifier of the Mishnah, Ravina Ravashi was the codifier of the Gemara. So, Lama Token, why do we sound a chauffeur? Are you, are you really for sure? Are you for real? You really mean to ask that question? Rachmana Amartiku, the terrorist says to do so. Rachmana means. The all merciful one, God. Rachamana Amar, the Torah says, God says to blow. Ella, no, no, no. I meant to ask, why do we also blow a Teruah? Not just, yeah, but we got also lamenting. Why do you do that? That's also a stupid question. But it says in the Torah to blow a Teruah. It says both. What are you asking? Typical Gemara. Ella, no, no. I mean to ask, why do we sound a Teruah? Marie? Why do we sound a Teruah? Rachmano Amar, Zichrein Trua. The Torah says to blow a mention of a true blast. Why are you asking this question? Okay, let me explain what I really mean to ask. I mean to ask not why do we blow in general, but why do we blow twice? We blow after the laning. We also blow in Shemon Why do we blow over and over again? Why not just blow a Kia and a Trua? How many sounds do we make on Shemon, by the way? How many sounds? No, but according to the Torah, how many sounds do you have to make? It's really, no, you have, to, you have to blow a tekiah and a true and a tekiah three times. That we know. But what does a true mean? The definition of true is not clear. Does it mean just a da, 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 that one, lamenting? Or is it the groaning sound, the, what we call shvarim? Da, da, da. Is it that? Or is it da, 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 da? or is it a combination of both? So we do all three methods. You do all three methods, you get 30, get 30 sounds. So the middle sound is the complex one, the one we're not sure of. So we either we do a, 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 a we do first a um, a um, uh, a shvarim true. We do both together. Then we do just the shvarim and then just the trua. Both together would not cover all bases either. I don't want to get into a halakha class right now. But shvarim trua, go kia shvarim trua kia kia shvarim trua kia kia shvarim trua kia. Okay, finish one side. Now, next method. Kia shvarim kia kia shvarim kia kia shvarim kia. Next, Kia true it's Kia, Kia true it's Kia, Kia true it's Kia. Together it's all it's 30. Why do we blow more than 30? Why do we blow 30 and then 30 again? Blow more than 30, we blow 100 actually. But why is it that we blow twice? That's the Gemara's question. Oh, now, now you're asking something good. I wasn't clear what I meant. I thought you understood what I'm saying. I meant to ask, why do we blow Schreifer, Kia, true over again? We did it once. Elo, Loma, Token, Umerian. Why do we sound the key and a true when we're allowed to sit down? That's before one S-ray after the laning. When you're allowed, if you want to, you can sit down. You don't have to stand up when you hear key the first 30 sounds. Why do we do that? Turn to the next page. And the next page continues. The next page. Let me see if I can find it. Turn it around. Page 16b1. The token 16b1, you have it? On top of the page, the left side. The token of Marian Kishain on them. And then again, we sound it here and it's true when they're standing. Why do we blow it twice? Huh? Got it? Don't have it? The answer is to confuse the Sutton. When he sees that the Jews are not suffice, not satisfied with one blowing, blowing again. He sees that we really are trying to crown Hashem as king, and we really are be, trying to be Mahadur in Mitzvahs. And he maybe gets the idea that this might sound like the key of uh, Mashiach. But wait a second. He's not stupid. The Sultan is not stupid. He knows that the reason why we blow is to confuse him. So why should he get so, why should he get confused? He knows we're not trying to do Mitzvahs. Just, the Torah says, try to confuse the Sultan. So he should say, ha, 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 you're not going to confuse me. Why does he get confused? So I guess the answer is like this. Here's the answer. Imagine if you were going to court and the judge tells one side, I want you to do something to confuse the other side. You're showing favoritism. So when Hashem says, I want you to confuse the Sutton, even though the Sutton knows you're trying to confuse him, he feels, hey, 
I feel I'm gonna lose this. If God is on their side, not on my side, he gets all, you know, down and loses faith in his ability to rescue. That's all my, I'm not sure if that's the right trap. This is my own trap, but whatever. Take it only. <laughs> The law, okay, so look, go, go weiter. Kedela Arabic Sutton to confuse the Sutton. Now, I ask you a question. Which one of the two blowings is the, is the Torah one? Which one is the additional one to confuse the Sutton? You would think the first one or the real one. That's, that's the 30 we have to blow. And the other 30 is to confuse the Sutton. Guess what? Most of the, of the Rishonim and the Alter Rebbe quotes, and he, I think also follows them. Hold that no, just the opposite. The first ones are the extra ones. The ones we blow in Shmon Esrei are the main ones. Why? Because they are accompanied with sukim, a pro proclaiming Hashem's kingdom, tem sukim, malchiot, tem sukim of zichronot, Hashem remembers us, and tem sukim about the importance of blowing a shofar. It's important to blow shofar with mentioning those sukim. Where are those sukim mentioned in Shmon Esrei, in the Musa? So that's the real deal. But we blow, so why don't, so why don't we just blow the extra ones after Dominic? Why blow the, 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 the secondary ones before the primary ones? One answer is because we're afraid if we blow, if we call, if we're gonna wait till after Dominic to blow the secondary ones, people are gonna say, I heard already, I heard already. It's only secondary, I don't need to hear it. So we blow the second ones, the secondary ones before the primary ones. No one's gonna leave the shul before you hear the real ones. That's one answer. Or it's good to blow so far before you dive into an esrit, Musa. So that the shofar blowing will have an impact on your success of your davening. So the two reasons why we want to have the secondary ones before the primary ones. We don't want to start with Musa first and then after Musa the second ones. No. First before Musa and then Musa. Who says this? Rabbeinu Nisim, one of the Rishonim, who lived about 150 years after the Rambam. Okay, now, I'm going to ask you, not now, but I'm going to ask you, uh, when did the Beis Yosef live? When did uh, the Arizal live? When did uh, um, the Shachs live? When did the Ramal live? When, 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 let's see where you're holding it. Huh? Should have like a test of matching, you know, generation <laughs> matching, you know, matching together. <laughs> like you do it to the children. It's good to know, but it's good to know history. Okay, by it. Now, if Yitzchak comes along and says, okay, very important thing. Now that he mentioned that there's also a blowing shaifa to confuse the sudden, and it's very important to confuse the sudden, because if you don't confuse him, he could be very dangerous. Amor Rabbi Yitzchak, in continuation to the previous statement that there's a very important blowing in order to confuse the sudden, says Rabbi Yitzchak, Kol shanash ain't taking love at any year in which they do not sound at kia. If for whatever reason there was no sounding of a kia, now we're not talking about the initial blowing, the blowing that you have to, we're talking about the extra blowing, the ones that are there to confuse the sudden. Let's say you blew 30, but you didn't blow more than 30. Well, that means you didn't confuse the sudden. And if you didn't confuse the sudden, that year might not be a very good year for you. Kol Shana, she ain't taken love at Chilo, Chilosa, that they did not blow Shoifer in the beginning. Miri in love they will sound a truer out of sorrow when, when, when there was a fast day, or, you know. Fast days were accompanied in the olden days with a sounding of a trua, which is lamenting, lamenting, sign of, of, of danger, sign of, uh, you know, of tragedy. So if you're not going to have the shofar heard in the beginning of the year, it can cause sorrow at the end of the year. You'll hear the same shofar at the end. Why? My time, what is the reason for saying this? The loy e of sudden, the sudden was not confused. Now, what does this mean that what you didn't blow shofar in the beginning of the year? Uh, does it mean through negligence? Well, that's for sure. It means that for sure. What about if it wasn't possible? How about if there was a decree amongst the non-Jews? Don't you dare? We're going to watch. If you sound the chauffeur, well, you'll all be slaughtered. Under duress. Is the Gemara saying that also? That if, if whatever reason the chauffeur is not heard, it's a bad sign. Okay, it's not your fault, but it's a sign from Hashem. The fact you stopped your chauffeur blowing is a sign that you better, uh, you know, be, be careful that year. So Tosla says no. Only if the reason, the only, he, uh, I'm sorry, Tosla says yes, my mistake. Tosla says yes, even if it was an onus, it still has a bad omen. It means something very bad is going to happen. Does that mean we're, we're doomed? No, 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 no. By contemplating on how bad it might be and being brokenhearted, that brokenheartedness will count as good as a chauffeur. As for the famous story of the Balshemto, you probably know the story. Is that Volk Kisses? 
Does that involve kisses? Okay, if I tell the story, I'm afraid to take more time. I want to learn something. Sometimes story of what? It's a very much a public story. Baal Shem Tov used to blow Shaifa. He was the Shaifa. He was the one who blew Shaifa in a shul. It was a chassid, a very, very prominent chassid. The name of Zev Wolf. His last name was Kitsis. Not a common name today. And the Baal Shem Tov said, Rabbi Zev, I want to give you a special schuss. Yeah. You'll be the one to blow Shaifa this year. Wow. But on one condition. you got to go through all the Kabbalah, all the writings of the Arizal, all the writings of the Ramak. Every, and he gave him oh, oh, oh. A plethora of, of who knows what, hundreds of pages. Can you take it upon yourself? Sure. And he started memorizing and then learning and learning like day and night. I mean, it was, it was 24 7. It was mummish into it like a whole month before in advance. And now finally comes the uh, moment of truth. Fast forward. We're in the shul right now and everyone's waiting for the Kia. And he had notes with him. Because he, all you need is to forget that I'm finished, I'm doomed. And right before the blowing, you know, I can't take my note. I just got one thing here. And you know what happens when you're in the shul like 770? No, no, no. And he went, oh, okay, okay, okay. He got even more nervous, tried to trace his trails. What did the guy do? Mr. Sugar, are you crazy? The devil's waiting for you. So he got so nervous, he couldn't wait. He has no, he, he forgot everything. And total amnesia. Everything he learned, he forgot. Uh, what happened? He forgot. He forgot. So it's a problem. What is he going to do? Can't not blow. Can't tell about Shemtu, I'm sorry. <laughs> he took the shoifer in his hand, he was shaking like this, and blew a tequila. He was, it was an ordeal. He's putting, he's betraying the Balshemtov. He just blew a tequila without, without thinking about what he's doing, without all the kavanas. And he, he said, he's thinking to himself, this is the worst, the most the torturous time of my life. I've never, ever, my wildest nightmare would have thought this could happen. And every sound he made was brokenhearted. And he finally finished. And he hid, he went down, went and sat on the floor and cried. And he was behind a whole bunch of other chassidim. A lot of chassidim there, so he was like, well, well covered. Well, Shem was coming out of shul, just like the Rebbe. Yantiv, 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 yantiv. The Rebbe is looking for you. Oh no, oh no. I have to face him right now. He gets up, throws himself on the feet of the Baal Shem and he says, Rebbe, Rebbe, forgive me, forgive me. I forgot everything. Like, Zev, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I want to thank you. Your Tkia Shoifer this year had the master key of all the chambers in heaven. Because brokenheartedness, there are certain keys, there are keys, you know, every key has this key of Simcha, the key of Tshuva, the key of Torah, the key of Tfilah, then there's the key of Shviras Halev, of brokenheartedness. That one supersedes everyone. You gave me the, ro the royal key, the master key. I saw things that I had an experience I never had before in my life. I want to thank you. You gave me the greatest the greatest yantam ever. Wow. You can imagine the <laughs> contrast I was feeling now. You know, the roller coaster. You went from brokenhearted to great joy. That's the story. So likewise over here, if a person is broken by the fact that you know that there was no suffer belong this year, it was it was held back under that itself can bring the end. So it's very important, as he says, that any year. Look at the next part. Well, I'm Rabbi Yitzchak. If you think that you're 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 far fallen, it's over. No circle is blown. Don't feel. Call shana sherosha betchilasa. Any year that is poor in the beginning, what does poor mean? That you feel uh, like a pauper. You feel you're beseeching God. You feel I'm not worthy of anything. You trust. This is not a lot of like be talking. You trust in God, but you don't trust in yourself. You say I'm not worthy. I must come on to God's infinite benevolence. If a person who feels that way, you're completely broken. Brokenhearted, Miss becomes prosperous. The year ends off very, very well. Shenema, how do we know this? It says in Chumash, Hashem's eyes are fixed on the land of Israel, may Rachis Hashana. But the word Rachis is spelled without an olive. Usually it's spelled with an olive. Like Rosh, Rach Alashin. Rachis is missing the olive. And if it's missing an olive, it sounds like Rush. Rush means poor. 
Rush, Dal. In many words in Hebrew, it means poor. Ani, Evyon, Dal, and Rush. Raise sin without the Aleph means impoverished. When you feel impoverished, brokenhearted, rejected, that helps the person have a very, very broad and prosperous year. Like the chauffeur is very narrow on the board, slightly below, and then the wide, wide end. So if you are in anguish, that's why we use a curved chauffeur. Like Bakvesht, you know, you usually say, you know, I'm not worthy of anything. I'm almost embarrassed to stand before Hashem and daven before him. That kind of feeling opens up the gates. It opens the gates of heaven. And Hashem will pour out a tremendous amount of prosperity. The Gashmish Amaruchnius. So racist, Hashem, racist, the Adachris. If there's racist, if there's rushless, rushless means poverty, then you have a, a good ending. Ad Achris. That will lead to the end of the year, so far, indicating that its end will be that it will have a future. I want to just let you know that there's a disagreement between Tosfus and others. Some say, no, no, only time you will have to suffer, only, the only time you, that the year will not end up good if there was no shepherd blowing is only if it was done by negligence, not for the onus. If it was done through uh, under duress, you weren't able to blow chauffeur. It could also be that, uh, you know, sickness, you know, if you had the COVID thing, if that's the reason why there's no shuffle blowing, then no, then there is. So there's a machlokis amongst the Rishonim, you know, what happens when it's an onus. Tosva seems to be very strict. Um, but then there's some say that there's two types of onus. One is you lost the chauffeur. Why'd you lose it for? There's some muzzle. It's not our fault. We're not neg neglecting it, but you lost it. Why'd you lose it? That's what Tosis means. But if it's taka under duress, like a xayra from Goyim, or there's no one who knows how to blow shofar, also not, not your fault. There's nobody who can blow. Simple people who don't know how to blow shofar. Uh, and you have to know the rules also, not just to blow, you have to know all the rules. And no one knows, it's a bunch of simple people. That's a different story. So there's a, a whole discussion amongst the uh, post game. What is the Gemara referring to when it says it wasn't blown? For sure, if it was not blown through negligence, for sure you're in trouble. When are you for sure not in trouble, according to everyone? Not even a thought. If it was Shabbos, for example, there's no shofar on Shabbos. That's not your fault. That's a different story. But Shabbos takes over. Shabbos compensates for shofar blowing. Onus, it depends what kind of onus it is. Onus means, uh, you know, under duress, forced. Yes. How does the Satan fall for the same thing? Huh? Or how uh, what? How does the Satan fall for the same trick after thousands of years? It's not a trick. It's like we were always saying the trick is confused. Every year, I know, because every single year, you know, based on what I just said before, but you see that every single you think, okay, now this year I'm sure God's gonna be on my side. I and mean, after all, look what they've done. And if he continues to show favoritism, every year is a new a new year, new rules, new calculations, new cheshbonot. And if Hashem is still on there. In spite of what just happened, look what these guys, look what these Jews are doing there. So that confuses them. I thought this year was going to be different. I really thought I had hope this year. Yes. We dress it. We're we're getting all festive. We're doing our hair. Correct. Our that doesn't nails, right. That, that's not in contradiction to what we're saying here. Because if the reason why you're brokenhearted because you don't believe in God's, you know, benevolence, then you're right. That's a problem. You have to have be talking. You have to be the simcha, but not a simcha of, yay, how we believing yourself. The simcha is a simcha that Hashem is His benevolence is is is, un, is, is unlimited. But in order to trigger that. Be talking triggers that level of, of Hashem's, you know, infinite, you know, powers. You have to have this broken heart, meaning don't feel that you are worthy of it. Don't give yourself any credit. So don't give yourself any credit and feel have be talking are not contradictory. Even I just said what I said. It's not a contradiction. You're asking a question. You're asking a good question. You're asking. Well, you should be asking a good one. That is that we see that people are dressed, we, we, we get dressed up on Rosh Hashanah, we eat, have a whole meal. Why? We dress up in white clothing, not our clothing, because we are 
sure that everything will turn out right. I thought you were asking, that seems to go in contradiction with the idea of brokenheartedness. I thought you were asking that. That's a cool question. So I'll, I'll give a cool answer. <laughs> the cool answer is that what I just said, you're not brokenhearted because you don't believe that God will ever answer your question. You're, you're, you're brokenhearted because you don't believe in yourself. You feel that you're not worthy. But in spite of your not worthiness, Hashem will overlook that. If you put your faith in him, he will overlook that. It doesn't mean that, that your brokenheartedness is fake. You have them both. You're broken, but you also have the faith in the king. They're two separate feelings. They're not going to victory. So I was talking about the confusing the Sahara, where we like don't know what's going on. And yeah, a lot of things we do. We don't work short for on Arab Shoshana. We don't. Um, uh, Okay. I want to just end with something. I know the Parsha, the Parsha of the Fast Tohar, the beautiful woman in war, and the Rafi says, so the Urachaim HaKadosh, contemporary of the Moshemto, asks a powerful question. He says, in the middle of a war, and people go to fight the war, are not just simple people, these are pretty, you know, prestigious men that are on a high level. In the middle of a miracle, and Hashem is showing open miracles, that's all, that's, you have, men are going to have that in their minds. They're going to think about, you know, this non-Jewish woman. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Then he asks another question. What happens if she's not, she's not beautiful? It says, you fast are beautiful. And what happens if she's not beautiful? She's not beautiful, so we should cut her hair. And it's later, later. Um, so let's say she's a healer. Without doing all that, she's not beautiful. She's really not beautiful at all. So the Gemara says, uh, so first it says beautiful. Then it says, but the you crave in her, even if she's not beautiful. So the Arachayim asks, then why say she's beautiful? Why do you have to say, why do you have to make me mislead me to believe that only if she's beautiful are you allowed to take her? But if he's not, not, and then you say, no, 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 even if you're not beautiful. So then don't mention beauty altogether. Why mention beauty? Just, just say a woman. Say any woman. Why saying a beautiful woman? And also, what, what is he called? Eishas Yifas Torah? How do you translate that? Eishas Yifas Torah means a beautiful woman. Eishas Yifas Torah means a wife. A wife of a Yifas Torah. What does that mean? She married. Her husband is a beauty? Eishas Yifas Torah. <laughs> The wife of your pastor. She say ish of your pastor. So Rashi answers, Aisha is ish, and even if she's married, and you can overtake her. That's even if she has, she's already married to someone. You're still allowed to take her. Okay. I don't, I'm not going into that right now. I want to just focus on the Yerachayim. He just says, but it doesn't say ish is ish. It says ish the wife of your pastor. Then it says the chashakta ba. You will crave in her. Crave in her. Crave her. Let me crave in her. The chashakta ba. The chashakta ota. Should have said, you will crave her. Why ba in her? And he answers all the questions with one answer. I'm not discussing, uh, you know, a um, craving that comes from the Asahara, you know, uh, uh, just wanting the that type of satisfaction that the world gets. This is a whole different story here. He sees something, this person, and only in war, while you're doing a mitzvah, fighting a war, can it be possible that if you have a craving, which is kind of strange, what, 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 why would you have a craving for the middle of a miracle? A miracle of God showing miracles? To Simon, there's something holy about this woman. There's some holiness in her. Not she's the beauty. There's a beautiful soul bah, in her that needs to be extricated. The fact you noticed it, the fact you have this taiva in the middle of a war is not normal. You know why you have this taiva? Because you are sensing spiritual radar system, you're sensing some holiness in her. That's what we're talking about. So even if she is not beautiful, the beauty is not her. The beauty is the person, the, the soul inside of her. And he goes on and on. I don't have time right now. It goes on and on. Brings the story with Dina and um, Shem. That when Dina was with Shem, she extricated an Neshama from Shem that was stuck in exile, and the that neshama was the neshama of Rabbi Hanina ben Shradion. And in fact, when Shem said to Yaakov's family, Yaakov's sons, "I will give you Rachavas your dying." Rachavat means a broad land, but Rachavas is also 
the abbreviation of four words, Rabbi Hanina Ben Tradion. So although he wasn't really thinking, but those words came out of his mouth, meaning there was a soul. And Dina wow. is holiness. And Rabbi Hanina is holy. Magnetic powers. She pulls. She says, that the soul of Rabbi Ben Tradion got stuck, cleaved onto Dina. As a result, she extricated his neshama. So Rakhine goes on to say, sometimes you free a soul that's trapped, but the one that's trapped in can never be, can never be uh, you know, helped. And then sometimes we have conversion like Rus and Nama, it's a whole long story, it's a fascinating Rakhine. So it's not a Yetzirah, that time of Yetzirah, it's a whole different kind of, it's as if you have a Yetzirah. Well, that's strange, in the middle of a, you know, your taiba is not for her, it's for something inside of her, it's for Hashak Aisha, she's the wife of, she's Mechabal, she is a recipient of the neshama inside of her. She's holding that soul in her. And that's what you want to free. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night's sleep.